Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by OpEdNews.com. Available on iTunes and Pacifica Radio and Progressive Radio Network and SoundCloud and Stitcher and, and YouTube. Uh, my guest for this show is David Swanson. He's the director of World Beyond War and campaign coordinator of RootsAction.org. He blogs at DavidSwanson.com and WarIsACrime.com. His books include War is a Lie, War is Never Just, When the World Outlawed War, and he hosts Talk Radio Nation. His new book is Curing Exceptionalism. Whoops, and there I go, I dropped it. You have a copy there to show? There you go. Yeah, all right. Curing exceptionalism, exceptionalism, what's wrong with how we think about the United States and what can we do about it? So, it's a great book. I love this book. I, right. You know, as soon as I saw the title, I thought, this is something we really need. <laughs> and uh, it is. It's, it's, it, you really delivered on the title. It's, it's, you've done a really great job, so thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Rob, because I've gotten a lot of compliments and a lot of criticism, mostly from people who have only read the title. Yeah. Uh, and some loved it and some hated it and ready to denounce me. I try to encourage them to maybe read the book first and then do that. But so Yeah, well, like, for example, the New York Post had a little comment, uh, exceptional idiocy. Yes. David Swanson touts his book, Curing Exceptionalism. And uh and basically, they insult you without having read it. Yeah, they, they explain what they think the book is about and then said, no, thank you. So yes. they protect themselves from learning anything. You know, it, you know this, was, this is what the book is about, is this attitude of, of arrogance uh, that says, oh, we don't need to, we don't need to know anything else. Uh, we know the United States is the greatest nation on earth. It's not, it's not something you ask questions about or try to measure or see if it's really true. You just believe it, you know, believe in it the way you believe in a religion or, you know, so this is, this is the guy at the New York Post sort of making my point. And I think he may be one of the harder people to reach and get to actually read the book. But no, he did you a great favor. Getting, getting a, a link in the New York Post is always a good thing. And uh, yeah, he, he's, you, you, you be grateful for the kind of enemies you have too sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause he is, he's just a, such a, a staunch right wing flamer. It <laughs> but some have come after me with more substantive arguments, albeit arguments that are refuted in the book. They haven't read like people immigrate here. So it is a better country than any other country. I, mean, I had a guy say this, uh, you know, on, on, some small outlet online and at the same time say you've mischaracterized u.s exceptionalism it's not the claim that the u.s is any better than anywhere else it's just the claim that it's unique while at the same time saying and i prove this by showing that people immigrate here because they don't want to live in those other rotten stinking places they like this place better so you know the the, the problem is with this you know kind of argument is they are claiming the United States is better than other places uh, while pretending not to. Uh, but the fact is that this idea that more people immigrate to the United States than anywhere else uh, is not remotely true in ter if you put it in terms of the U.S area or the US population or the US economy or you know the United States is one of the bigger nations on earth so of course it's going to be at the top in some things but it is nowhere near the top not remotely in terms of accepting refugees who need shelter you know and it has immigration policies that favor Europe and favor people with skills and people with money uh, you know so and it is not remotely near the top in the list of uh, nations that treat immigrants well after they get there, you know. So, of course, the United States uh, is a safer, better place to live than many other countries, but it's nowhere near the top of the list. And that's where you have really done an incredible job. You've put together uh, a huge collection of examples of ways that the U.S. is not exceptional. Yeah. Where it's far from first. And really, the areas where the U.S. is first 
are an embarrassment, really. Yeah, this, I mean, the book has four parts, and the first part is really a look at statistics and uh, empirical comparisons. Can we see, is it really the greatest nation on earth? Is it the most free? And you look at every definition of freedom and liberty, including capitalism as economic liberty, and including U.S. think tanks and U.S. government and CIA-funded think tanks, and nobody anywhere on the planet ranks the United States as first in any definition of freedom or liberty. Or uh, democracy. I mean, I love the way you've really done research on how these different organizations rank countries for democracy, for justice, for freedom, for liberty, and the U.S. does not score that well, especially among the leading nation, the, the, the G20, for example. That's right. I mean, in a lot of categories, the United States is, is at the bottom for the whole world. In others, it's at the bottom for wealthy countries, you know, and so there are a lot of areas in which the United States is, is doing better for itself than most poor countries, uh, but is way below every other wealthy country. But, uh, but let's take a step back, okay, because I, I, I want to get into a bit more some of this, this, the stats that you've come up with because they're fascinating. But let's take the big picture. Why why'd you write this book? Well, it's sort of, you know, to, to give you what the four sections of the book are, which explains why I wrote it, after looking at how the U.S. compares to other countries, I look at how people think about that, uh, which is bizarre and disconnected entirely from the, those stats and figures because the U.S. is just at the top in the world in patriotism and nationalism and belief in superiority. And, and then in, in the third section of the book, I look at what damage that does because the United States is at the top in willingness to wage war, in willingness to wage war without the United Nations, uh, in thinking of itself as superior and able and right to impose its will on other countries, uh, in arrogantly rejecting aid and assistance, actual emergency aid, but also knowledge and developments from other countries so that the, the exceptionalism doesn't just harm the people on the other end of, of U.S. bombs and U.S. policies, but the United States' refusal to accept developments in health coverage or gun control or retirement or green energy or anything else from the rest of the world hurts the people in the United States. Uh, and, and, and so in the final part of the book, I look at, well, what we, could we do better? How could we think and act better? But, but the purpose of writing the book is to address something that I don't just see as intellectually mistaken, but I see as incredibly damaging. This exceptionalist thinking, by, by, by which I mean thinking the United States is better, different and better than the rest of the world. And with a sort of a missionary uh, attitude of imposing its will on the rest of the world for the rest of the world's own good, whether they like it or not, and they generally don't, uh, you know, that, that attitude, it, it's more an attitude than, a, than an empirical conclusion based on facts, is, is really damaging to the people who hold it as well as to the people it impacts. So... I, the, the missionary aspect of it is, is really, I think, important. I think uh, when you think about exceptionalism, this is a, a kind of message that was brought over to the New World by the conquistadors as well. This whole Western European, Western world European idea that what we bring you is better, is best, and what you have is no good is disgusting, is, is savage. Yeah. Uh, really, I think it's, these are come from the sa they're fruit from the same tree. Yeah. And, and I think even more so the Puritans and some of the British uh, colonists in North America uh, certainly brought attitudes uh, of this sort that have endured uh, and, and been more impactful than those of the, of the Spanish in, in Latin America. Um, tell, tell me a little bit more about those. Well, I mean, the, the, the attitude you've seen uh, and is expressed in the writings and, uh, and 
and sermons and statements uh, of, of early British colonists uh, and Puritan ministers and so forth. Uh, the, the, the colonial settler attitude of, of devaluing uh, anyone who already lived here, uh, treating them as subhuman uh, and treating it as sort of a, 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 a mission that combines sadism with benevolence, right? We're going we're gonna to get these people because they deserve it and we're going to improve them whether they deserve it or and not. God uh, is, is yeah, behind right. us. Right, God is behind us, uh, and the I mean the the French and Indian Wars, as they called them, the the French were were the Antichrist. You know the 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 American Revolution against the British. This was heaven against hell. These are the terms it was understood in, and this has been, I mean, right up through the present moment. This has been the understanding of many people in the United States. I mean, you look at the posters from World War I of Jesus Christ uh, sighting down a gun barrel, an American gun barrel, of course. It, this has been the attitude that U.S. Uh, manifest destiny, U.S. expansionism, the U.S. Monroe Doctrine, and so forth, are, are the work of God, our holy work, are, uh, you know, beyond reproach, beyond question, something to put your, your faith in. And the level of patriotism and flag worship and nationalism that has just exploded in particular since World War II, where a lot of the exceptionalists I, I quote and talk about really see the origins of the, of the exceptional U.S. state, uh, is, is unique. I mean, you can't take anything away from its uniqueness. You can travel much of the globe, including most wealthy countries, and never see a flag. You know, and you'll, you'll hear a national anthem, maybe if there's a, an international event, you know, the Olympics or some big national event, but not every kid's sporting event and not standing like little fascist robots and pledging allegiance to a flag. I mean, these are these are very unique uh, American experiences that a lot of the world is, is just scandalized by. Who benefits? Qui, qui bono? <laughs> well, it, to the extent that we're talking about militarism, the profiteers of the militarism benefit, uh, to the extent that we're talking about, you know, jingoistic politics, some politicians benefit or think they do, uh, you know, we... We certainly have people who think they find personal emotional benefit in believing themselves better than 96% of humanity uh, because of where they live, because of where they were born or immigrated to, the flag they worship, and, and uh, who imagine that somehow their identity is that of the of the US nation you know as as Howard Zinn used to say we we talk about the national interest as if your interest and Charles Koch's interest and Donald Trump's interest are all the same uh, we also talk about things we quote we did in the past long before you or I were born you know we defeated the british which was somehow better than the canadians not defeating the british we won the Cold War, as if that were somehow better than ending the Cold War. Uh, you know, and, and so when you identify yourself, your own identity, with that of the U.S. government and the Pentagon, and you imagine in the back of your head that that's of some emotional benefit to you, uh, well, this predisposes you very strongly to become aware of good things that your, your national identity did or in the past or does now uh, or that you can imagine it did and to avoid hearing about bad things. You know, as George Orwell famously said, the nationalist will not just support atrocities committed by his or her own nation, but will show a remarkable ability for never hearing about them. Uh, and, and so who wants to hear about atrocities committed by the U.S. government when you are the U.S. government, that's my personal, I mean, uh, some friends and I were outside a big theater here in Charlottesville, Virginia yesterday, as, as we're speaking here, uh, and there were a number of outrageous speakers inside on a panel, including a guy named John Negroponte, uh, who, of course, facilitated death squads in Nicaragua back in the 1980s, and then in Iraq in the 2000s, it, you know, and we were handing out appropriate questions to ask him to the people going in, and I hope some of them followed through, but most of them had never heard of the guy. 
never heard of him. Uh, you know, whereas if he had done something remarkably praiseworthy uh, and had been, you know, become a sort of hero of humanitarianism in a, in a really deserving way, people would have heard about him uh, because it would have been something good for the United States and its flag and our national identity. So, you know, so the, so the, so the filter on the facts is important here. So, you know, I call the show the bottom up show because I think we're transitioning from a top down culture to a more bottom up one. And I like to look at how top down forces and bottom up uh, energies uh, interact and exceptionalism is really a very top-down kind of a concept. And I think it, it comes from patriotism and nationalism and uh, maybe even from monarchy, where uh, back in the day, monarchs would claim that they were kings and queens because God made it so. Uh, so talk a little bit about nationalism and, and those other things. Where do they fit in? And this whole idea of authoritarian and top-down aspects of it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, when you start to criticize your nation or the nation that's, uh, that's labeled yours uh, and to oppose its fighting wars, you are very often immediately lumped with, you know, well, you're a traitor, you're supporting an enemy, you're supporting some other nation, you're supporting the defeat of your nation and so forth. Uh, or, you're labeled uh, is supposedly a, a compliment rather than an insult. You're labeled a good patriot, a true patriot, or a true nationalist, which is good, not a patriot, which is bad, or vice versa. You know, people have their linguistic preferences. I want to do away with nationalism and patriotism. I don't want you to go take pride in some other country or feel shame about some country. I want you to, to minimize, if not eliminate, the identification with a country. I want, the, when you say we, for it to mean people you know, your family, your friends, your community, your town, or all of humanity. That's a useful thing for we to mean, because that's who's got to survive and prosper if you're going to. You know, we're all going to that together. we all the living beings? And right, beyond just one species, indeed. Uh, that's what it. That's what it should mean. Um, but you're right that the that the roots of this are in nationalism and in monarchy. Uh, and I mean, it's it's worth noting that Donald Trump now has vastly superior powers to what any monarch on earth has ever had now or in any bygone era. Uh, and someone who can tweet a threat to start World War Three. Uh, you know, and untweet it the next day or whatever. Uh, I mean, this is a sort of power no king or queen ever had before. Uh, and it's treated as something nationalistic, patriotic, worthy of royalistic uh, respect by many people in the United States. Uh, people in the United States who love monarchy, who are more obsessed with the, the British monarchy than the British are. Uh, and when you have a Congress that some months back now, I saw a congressional hearing where they're talking about whether they can take the power away from Donald Trump to launch a nuclear war without congressional authorization, which would then presumably make it a good nuclear war if Congress, you know, quote unquote, authorized such a mass murderous crime, uh, you know, and, and they to a man and woman said, we're hopeless, we're powerless, we have no ability whatsoever to, to stop Donald Trump if he wishes to destroy the earth. We just will be sad that the earth is being destroyed, but that's the extent of our available, uh, you know, as if the purse weren't in the Constitution, as if impeachment and removal from office weren't in the Constitution, as if the UN Charter and the Kellogg-Briand Pact weren't treaties that are the supreme law of the land under the Constitution. So you have this self-imposed powerlessness in the people's so-called representatives who are all bought and paid for, and you have a, you have a monarchy, essentially. Well, I think, I think this again gets back into this whole top-down authoritarian aspect of our culture. Uh, most authoritarian people are not the ones who say, this is what we're going to do. They're the ones who say, yes, sir, this is what you want, and we'll do it because that's all we're able to do. And I think 
I think it's worse with people born before 1980. I think people born after 1980 have been marinated in a good chunk of their lives in the internet and texting and smartphones. And I think they have a different attitude and they're not quite as marinated in authoritarianism so that they can think a little better, hopefully. Uh, I hope I, you're right. I, I, but I think that those people born before 1980, that would make them 38 or older. I think that they are pretty much very susceptible to giving up their power, giving up their agency, giving up their ability to question and challenge authority. And uh, you know, I think that there, some religion has contributed to that. All the major religions have very authoritarian branches and, and, and aspects to them. And I think that they synergize with exceptionalism. What do you think? Well, you know, there are a lot of different issues to be active around, right? And I, in recent years, have been most active around war and peace. And I don't think there's been a gathering on that issue uh, in particular in the United States uh, in the past 30 years or more that didn't include a well-deserved discussion of why everyone in the room was so old and so white and so middle to upper class. And, and so, you know, to say that young people uh, have a better attitude than old people, I mean, I, I have certain reasons to think that's right uh, and in certain types of activism. But if it wasn't for the old people who became active during the war on Vietnam, there essentially wouldn't be a peace movement in the United States to speak of. Uh, there would be some young people active against Israeli wars. Uh, there would be a handful of people following one or the other of the big political parties when the other political party made some bad move uh, related to war. Uh, and that would be it. Now, I'm working night and day to change that. Um, but it's, you know, it's encouraging to me when I hear good things about young people because they ain't there. They ain't in the room. Uh, not yet. No, I agree. I agree. We need to do a station ID now. Uh, we need to do a station ID now. Uh, this is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com. Uh, actually, I've already done it for the beginning of this TV part, so I'm going to delete this for the radio show and leave a little blank space so I can find it easier. <laughs> Okay, and my guest for this show is David Swanson. He's the author of a new book, Curing Exceptionalism, What's Wrong with How We Think About the United States and What Can We Do About It? And I think the, the, the most important word in that title, besides exceptionalism, is curing, because that suggests that exceptionalism is a disease. Yeah. It's an affliction. It's a delusion. And it's a, it's a mass delusion. So yes. have, have you talked to psychiatrists about mass delusion? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will plead the fifth on that one. Uh, <laughs> no, thankfully I, I haven't. There's some people I would recommend do so. But, uh, it, you know, uh, of course I have read some books by psychologists and psychiatrists about this topic and about our current president and so forth. But I, 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 I wanted to say with regard to obedience, you know, I, I think when you have little kids trained to pledge obedience to a flag, and then you have the ability to wave that flag and say, do this because of this flag, you know, you get people willing to do things they would otherwise know better than to do. And, and so the part of curing this disease uh, is, is getting people out of these habits, out of this trained, uh, conditioned obedience and flag worship and troop worship and war. But, but it's also institutionalized. When you have kids doing it in school, that's part of a system. It's an institutionalized element in basically brainwashing people to automatically think this way reflexively. Well, it is. And it's in our language. It's in our textbooks. It's in our media. It's in our entertainment. It's, you know, the United States has an administration. Another government has, you know, a, a, a regime, in particular, if it's a government that needs to be bombed soon. Uh, the, the way in which people talk about the United States and talk about the rest of the world, uh, there's no comparison. There's a double standard built in. Uh, often. When you say when the way people. Speak, you're talking about the way Americans speak. 
Yeah, I'm talking about this 4% of humanity, uh, and in particular, the language that comes at it from its television sets and from books and from newspapers, uh, and that is generally internalized and repeated by millions of people in the United States. Uh, you know, there's this, this habit created of thinking of the United States as different from the rest of the world, uh, and in fact, writing the rest of the world out of existence as unimportant, as not mattering. Uh, so a, a lot of exceptionalism is devaluing and demeaning the other 96% of humanity. A lot of it is just ignoring it. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I think that, uh, you know, I've done a lot of uh, writing and interviewing about narcissism and psychopaths. And what you're describing, somebody who doesn't care about other people who only cares about themselves that's a narcissist right and if that person then acts to hurt other people to, to take care of his interests that's a psychopath so uh i i don't know how big a leap it is for you but it, it seems to me that exceptionalism is a symptom of national narcissism really I couldn't agree more, and I think I've made comments to this effect uh, with you in the past about your studies of, of sociopaths, you know, to the extent that, yes, I think there's a value in trying to figure out and identify as individuals who is a sociopath, but I think there are that, that many, many behaviors that are sociopathic by, by general definition are society-wide. I mean, this is a, there's a statement. Society-induced. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, there, there's a statement by Friedrich Nietzsche that, that Dan Ellsberg quoted in his recent book on nuclear madness uh, that said something to the effect of insanity is, is rare in individuals, but in societies, it's the norm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Ain't that the truth? Uh, so it, I can't speak for every society, but in this society, uh, you've got beliefs that have no connection to facts, uh, desires for actions that are counterproductive on their own terms, uh, you know, the, the, the arrogance and the militancy uh, of U.S. exceptionalism is destructive and damaging uh, and has no connection to the reality of how the rest of the world perceives the United States, how the United States actually measures up against the rest of the world. I mean, you're taking a country that is number one in prisons, 4% of the, of the people of the world and 24% of the prisoners of the world is number one in military spending and wars and warships and bases. That's, you know, that's number one in all sorts of things that are just not to be proud of, you know, areas of uh, uh, acres of, of land paved with asphalt, uh, obesity, television viewing, belief in angels and so forth. And, and then nowhere near the top in the things where it should be and could easily be uh, life expectancy, health, happiness, democracy, uh, infant it, mortality, uh, infant mortality, children's health, uh, you know, and, and so to, to take that country. Uh, and make it number one in patriotism and flag waving and the you know the greatest number of flags per uh, per person and the and the the you know the number twice of guns the willingness, too. Uh, in what people tell pollsters you know twice the willingness as in some countries to participate in wars you know the forty four percent in the United States saying they would participate in a war. What's, you know, what's preventing these tens of millions of people from finding the nearest recruiting station or army career office, I can't tell you, except that they're lying, that they're fantasizing that they would participate in a war, uh, which is why the NRA puts out videos with has-been country singers saying we need a new war against Iran and so forth, because it sells guns for people to play with in their backyards. This sort of fantasy life uh, has an impact because, you know, it, it puts clowns who are engaged in it in the power of, of royalty in Washington. So uh, uh, my, my friend Tom Hartman has a website, smallpenisgunowners.com, <laughs> for uh, NRA people. Uh, and I, I kind of think of gun ownership for a lot of people being a, a, a kind of a form of Viagra for feeling more manly, more macho, more virile. Uh, is exceptionalism uh, in that category too, do you think? 
Uh, I think there's a big overlap. I don't think in either case it's an absolute identity down to every yeah. single man and woman, but I think it's a big overlap. It's a big part of it. Uh, I think masculinity as misunderstood in the United States as this violent machoistic uh, identity uh, is is tied up with U.S. exceptionalism, uh, which, uh, I mean, if you read uh, something like the Cheney's, uh, Dick and Liz Cheney's co-authored book uh, on exceptionalism as a good thing, uh, there is not a single mention of any of those topics we just went through, life expectancy, education, happiness, uh, health. It's entirely about war. And what um, you make clear in your book is that they never actually provide support for any of the claims that they make either. No, absolutely not. Uh, there's the, you know, these claims that the United States is the most free and brings the most freedom to the rest of the world and so forth. And it's just sort of a mantra to be taken on, on faith. Uh, you know, greatest nation on earth is almost just the name of the United States to go in one ear and out the other without a thought process. Uh, but no, there are, there aren't any, uh, you know, any, any numbers. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of what U.S. Pub political discourse consists of is is pure rhetoric, anyway. Without any way to, you know, when when somebody tells you that you can justly kill up to forty nine civilians to bomb a building where ISIS stored some cash, you know, there's no empirical mechanism to go out and measure whether forty nine really is the right number, or it's six, or it's. 85,000, you know, it's, it's just a made up number, you know, and, and in order to say something about it being a proportional just strike, you know, uh, and, and, and most of U.S. political discourse is like that. It, it, there's no debating it. There's no disproving it. It's just rhetoric. Uh, so, so what do you say to somebody when you have a conversation, let's say, let's say, let's say you meet somebody and you've got your book and they're they're of the exceptionalist mind how do you debate them how do you dis how do you how do you present it to them how, do you try even or what do you do with somebody like that i i think and i and this is sort of the point of the fourth and final section of the book is to try to work with how do we think our way out of this uh, you know, and I go through a number of techniques, uh, some of which I've tried to some extent with some success. Uh, one of them, I think, is to reverse roles on people, to say, imagine that uh, 70 years ago, North Korea, a couple of drunk North Koreans late at night drew a line from sea to shining, shining sea across the United States and created the South United States and the North United States with a militarized border. Uh, and then bombed flat 80% of the cities in the North United States and imposed a, a, a horrible dictatorship on the South United States and refused to allow reunification, refused to allow a peace agreement, kept military control of the South United States and so forth. And then you had this crazed North Korean leader threatening fire and fury uh, and destruction of, uh, of people in the North United States. Uh, how how would you feel, you know, regardless of what shortcomings and horrendous, outrageous crimes the North United States government itself might be guilty of? How would you how would you feel about how North Korea was threatening you? Would it scare you, you know, or you know, take take Okinawa and try to put it in the United States, right? So, in the state of Mississippi, you have the Japanese military building giant military bases uh, in almost every town, routinely crashing airplanes into buildings and fields, killing people, uh, raising hell, getting drunk, raping and killing girls of, uh, uh, from Mississippi. Uh, and the local and the state government want to kick out all the Japanese troops, but Washington, D.C. won't allow it. The Japanese empire tells you it's for your own good, whether you know it or not, and doesn't really care what you think. You know, would you be happy with that? Would you be content with that? And, and then try to think if you lived in Okinawa uh, and you were a human being who mattered too, how would you think about the U.S. military's identical behavior 
in Okinawa. And, and you know, I got to so, tell you, I, I, it makes sense what you're saying, but I think that you would lose an awful lot of people who are exceptionalists. Uh, I don't think that they would sit and listen to that whole pitch. Well, you know, you, you got to you keep got going. To get, Give me some money. other solutions. I mean, I, I mean, I. <laughs> I'm I'm thinking of the the people I know who who are like that. Uh, they would just shake their head and go, "Oh, they just wouldn't." Uh, you know, you, we we need. You're on the right track, I think. But I'm I'm challenging you. We need stronger stuff. You know, I go to groups. I I don't just speak to peace groups, right? I speak to groups of college students, random groups of the public. I do debates with, you know, the guy who teaches quote unquote ethics at West Point, and we get pro war and anti war people in the room. And at all of these events, I poll everybody at the beginning to figure out where they stand on these questions, and I poll them again at the end. Oh, that's cool. In every case there's significant movement in the right direction, even when it's a debate, you know, so I can tell who won the debate. There's significant movement in the right direction in people's opinions. And, and we'll, we'll survey them at the end and I'll announce the results and I'll explain, look at how much some of you moved in the direction I was trying to move you in. Great idea. And we'll still raise their hand and say, but none of this actually works because you can't change people's minds. It just can't be done. And I'll say, but, we just did change people's minds and we just empirically documented changing people's minds. And I know you can't always easily immediately change everybody's mind, but listen to what you're saying and what we just did in this room. One conversation. Still, so are, are there, are there interventions that you envision to change the brainwashing that we have? I mean, it seems to me like we, we need to do things in elementary school. We need to change oh, yeah. things throughout the, the life continuum. Well, stop accepting, stop not taking a knee or rejecting the Star Spangled Banner and the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, stop saying we to mean the US military. Stop thinking in those terms, get rid of the flags, make some friends abroad, travel abroad, become part of other cultures, uh, become a citizen of the globe, get a world passport, start thinking in local and global and non-nationalistic terms. Uh, and, and yeah, we've got to start with kids. Kids have to be taught that they're part of humanity. Kids have to be taught the history and the culture of the species and other species, not, you know, this little corner uh, of the globe uh, with, with all of the the arrogance that comes with it because you know you say well we're just teaching u.s history for these eight years and then there's going to be that six months when we'll teach world history so they're going to get a well-rounded education but but you're not just teaching u.s history when you teach that a revolution was needed to get rid of the british because you don't mention the canadians or the australians or any place where it wasn't or a, a, a bloody civil war was needed to get rid of slavery I think we also need to deal with a global accomplishment without civil war in most places, right? So you're you're erasing most of the globe through your so-called, you know, U.S. history. Yes, you. Well, the the good news is history is really changing, and uh, in the last thirty or forty years, history departments and universities have really gone kind of topsy turvy. Used to be that most of history that was taught was top-down history of people of power and generals and the, the white ruling class and monarchs. And now those people are kind of like dinosaurs and it's history is, is taught about farmers and minorities and communities and things like that. And so that's yeah. helpful. And uh, now if that could only translate into elementary schools. And I think the other thing is that it, it needs to happen in, in, in churches and, and mosques and synagogues too. People need to start learning uh, I, I like to think about it as connection consciousness, awareness that we're all connected to each other, yeah. uh, kind of an extension of the golden rule that uh, do as, to others as you would do unto yourself. And by the way, we're all part of the same ecosystem and continuum, so we're all part of each other. Well, I think that trend in college history courses that you're talking about has some Howard Zinn influence uh, on it. Who's Absolutely. Been- 
whose books are still getting banned from high schools and middle schools. And uh, That's the People's you know, History of the United States. People's History of the United States and other great books by Howard Zinn and the whole genre of a people's history of this, that, and the other that's been inspired by Howard Zinn has been tremendous. But these are books that are being banned uh, by school boards uh, from pre-university education in various parts of the United States. And any mention of other countries, you know, there's not just, you know, the, the, the demand that other countries be demeaned, but that they not be discussed at all, that, that only the United States be taught. This is the demand of some of the exceptionalist activists that, are, that bring this demand to school boards, you know. Okay, so we're going to come back. I got to do another station ID. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on iTunes and Stitcher and Pacifica Radio and Progressive Radio Network. My guest for the show to, to, for now is David Swanson. He's the director of World Beyond War and campaign coordinator of RootsAction.org, and he has a new book out. Curing Exceptionalism, What's Wrong with How We Think About the United States and What Can We Do About It? And I want to keep talking more about what we can do about it. What can, what can the listeners do about it? What can they do today? What can they do in making plans for the next year? How can they change things? Uh, I, I think they can get together with other people and have discussions like this one and practice, practice thinking and talking uh, as human beings, not as members of one little subgroup of humanity. Uh, that is, walk through people who are willing to try it, walk through the countless examples, and I sort of lay out a template uh, of infinite possibilities of how you can look at different aspects of the world uh, without the U.S. exceptionalist lens. Uh, some of it reversing roles, as I, as I talked about and gave a couple examples, but, uh, but also just the way there, I, I quote in, in the book, uh, there's a, an, an editor at the Washington Post. I don't think I've ever quoted such a person in any book before, an editor at the Washington Post. But this woman has taken stories about incidents in the United States and written them as if they were written by the Post or the New York Times or anything else about some other country. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's this increasing opening your eyes to how the United States is looked at and how the rest of the world is looked at differently. Uh, that and basically I, it, what you've described with her writing is that if you describe what happens in the United States as though it happened somewhere else, it looks like it's a third world country, basically a horrible third world country, a terrifying one. Well, it, it looks like a place inhabited by irrational animals with ancient medieval passions and inevitable trends to be studied by anthropologists, rather than a place inhabited by thinking, acting human beings with agency and respect. Uh, and, and so when you know, she rewrites the, the fascist rally that happened here in, in Charlottesville as if she were writing about some other country that is in the language that the Washington Post would use if it were in some other country. So, you know, she talks about the, you know, the, the former Confederate uh, stronghold and the uh, Confederate uh, minority, the, the, the white ethnic minority group uh, and, and so forth. You know, when you talk about minority ethnic groups rather than demographics and populations and so forth is just changing the language. It doesn't really change the meaning, but it sounds like it changes the meaning uh, when you talk about a regime rather than an administration and so forth. Uh, you know, I think also, you know, a lot of curing the problem is understanding the problem, which is the point of the first three sections of my book. If people become aware of how the rest of the world sees the United States. Well, one part that I liked, uh, I, 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 it was actually a bit of good news, and it, it, it's, it's a lesson for us, I think, is the, the reason that the world likes the United States is because of soft power. It's because our arts and our movies and our stories. Yeah, the, the United States 
is the most influential, is, has the most popular songs and movies. Uh, and part of that has to be because people like some of the content that's in those things. Uh, so that's, you know, perhaps to the credit of the United States. A lot of it is because of the, the high production value, the predominance of the English language, the, the skill in the marketing and, and promotion and so forth. Uh, but what a world would it be if the countries that were best at things were the most influential in them? So if the countries that were good at health coverage had the most influence on the rest of the world in health well, coverage. Let me just finish. Let me just finish. Where I'm going with this soft power, where our culture, our stories are, are beloved, uh, and they are a positive for us, is I think you wrote a piece today where you asked the question, what if we, instead of that, that you, you mentioned uh, somebody who had suggested instead of going to war with, with uh, it was it Iraq or Afghanistan, instead we built schools for every person who had been killed in, in 9-11, in the towers. Yeah. I mean, what if we had built 3,000 schools in, in Afghanistan? It would have cost us a lot less than the trillions and trillions of dollars that we've spent. And it might, might as you wrote, it might have done a heck of a lot better for us in terms of where we would be right now. Yeah, uh, again, power. again, depending who we and us and we and our are, but uh, the, the, the U.S. Ooh, yeah, I got to watch that, that we stuff. Uh, well, I've never met uh, anyone, including myself, who doesn't do it. But, uh, but I think, it, and you know, and there are arguments in favor of it, but I think they fall far short. Uh, the, 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 the U.S. government could exercise its enormous influence for the good very easily and for very little financial and other expenses uh, if it chose to. Uh, and I think that's important. Uh, that being said, I think it would be worthwhile for activists to hesitate and catch themselves, advocates for good global change, when they demand that the United States be the leader on every issue under the sun, including all the things the United States is bringing up the rear on, you know. <laughs> so the United States needs to be the leader in reforming justice systems and, you know, good prison policies. And so, you know, it, the United States would do very well to just begin to follow up to the, you know, catch up to the second worst country on earth in terms of mass incarceration, for example. Uh, so I, I think, you know, on the one hand, we have to recognize the potential power uh, in, in U.S. influence, uh, but also figure out if some humility, some cooperation, some collaboration, some fitting in as a piece of a larger whole might be better for all of us individuals uh, if it were adapted to, uh, adopted by the U.S. government. And I think it's interesting because I, I really like what you just said about uh, we don't need to think about being the leader in anything. Uh, the whole idea of leadership is an idea that is actually starting to be replaced. There are new models that are non-hierarchical for companies, and it's also being used for government, where instead of having somebody at the top who's the boss, the power and the responsibility is distributed throughout the people who are working and there's it's actually it's a little more complicated than having a simple hierarchy because it means that there is a set of rules that are used to determine who makes decisions and how they get made uh i did an interview interview with brian robertson who who's written a book called holacracy uh and there are over 500 different organizations using holacracy now this, this non-hierarchical approach. And I think that when you just mentioned the word leadership, there's a whole alternative way of thinking that is not something that is easy to get our heads around because we are so damn marinated, so damn indoctrinated in the idea that leadership is good. To be a good leader is the answer. And it doesn't have to be. It, it, perhaps the answer is, as uh, perhaps what a, the greatest leader can do is let go of his leadership. Yeah. And it's usually yeah. a man. So I say his yeah. and, and hand the power to the people who are entrusted with it. 
And I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's that kind of thinking that would allow for more openness to the sort of, of global as well as local decision making that we need if we're not going to destroy this planet in short order. Uh, because as soon as you say the United States government at the federal level shouldn't decide everything, uh, a certain number of people immediately shout, well, you want an evil, tyrannical global government to lead and decide everything. Uh, to which I reply, actually, I want a lot of power to revert to the people and to local governments and local. Some to state governments. And I want an, actually a smaller federal government, but I want it to invest far more heavily in every human and environmental need we ever hear about. And I want to accomplish that miracle of a smaller government that puts more into everything by cutting the military, which is 60% of, of discretionary spending. And I want an increase in global decision-making that is necessary for dealing with global problems, but I want it with the sort of understanding that you're talking about, which is what would allow for a world federation uh, that, didn't, that didn't terrify everyone uh, and, and that actually meant world cooperation, uh, which is you know, the only way we're gonna survive this mess. I think that one of the elements to, that are, that's absolutely necessary to make that happen is some kind of a quantum leap in trust. Somehow, we have to start trusting each other and creating vehicles for communicating and making decisions where we trust. Yeah, and if we, yeah. And if we write off 96% of humanity as untrustworthy, as you know, people you can't negotiate with, can't talk to, can't rely upon, and, and, and routinely demonize them uh, in war propaganda uh, and devalue them as you know, collateral damage, we're not going to get there. And it's sure not going to start with the United States because the United States has a leader who lies four times a day on average or more. Yeah, six so times trust is not something to be expected to be built by the United States in the near future. We've got a lot of work to do to take care of that and to turn that around. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So what are you going to do with this book? Well, unless you have any other brilliant ideas, I'm going to try to get it into the hands of everybody I can uh, and talk to them about it and help them read through it and ask them for their feedback and improvements. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, it, it's available anywhere and the organizations I work with are using it as premiums for donors and uh, giving it to people that way. What's um, the best way people can get it if, who are listening here? Uh, well, if you go to davidswanson.org and click on books, you'll find an audio version and a Kindle version and an ebook and a PDF, as well as uh, a way to get me to send you a signed uh, paperback. Uh, you'll, but, you know, the best thing is to support your local bookstore. Uh, if you can't do that or don't have one, you know, you can get it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Powell's or whatever. Um, you can also, uh, you know, invite me to come talk about it. Uh, I prefer uh, to talk to large groups and groups that are not pre-selected as tending to agree with me. I prefer to talk in debates uh, with someone who in a civilized manner disagrees with me because we get different people in the room that way. What are the arguments for uh, exceptionalism that you encounter in debates? Uh, well, the debates I was talking about having done most recently with this uh, gentleman who teaches quote-unquote ethics at West Point Military Academy uh, happened just before I wrote this book, uh, so they weren't in particular about this book. Um, they were about, is war ever justified? Uh, and I was taking the no position and he the yes. So I have a previous book called War is Never Just. Um, and of course, he was arguing the usual case that uh, that war is sometimes justified, which uh, it generally breaks down to because Adolf Hitler, uh, you know, and we can have another show sometime if we haven't already where we go through what, what the problems are with, you know, making our top public expense and, and damage and risk uh, based on a, a misunderstanding of something that hasn't been around for three quarters of a century. But uh, I, I think there are people who believe exceptionalism is a good thing, believe it's not a question of arrogance or condescension, but simply of uniqueness and love for uh, your home and, and so forth. And 
uh, I think most of them are choosing to misunderstand uh, what the rest of us are concerned about, uh, which would become very, very clear to them if they would read past the title of the book and try reading the book. Uh, but What did you learn in, in doing the research, and there's extensive research in here, what were the most surprising things that you learned that really lit light bulbs for you? Yeah, you know, many years ago when I wrote War is a Lie, I thought... A fabulous I, book, by the way. I love that book. It's brilliant. Right. Thanks, thanks. I, I, I think we did uh, discuss it at the time, too, so yes. thank you for everything over the years. But uh, I, I, I was surprised, I think, to find the degree of similarity. I was expecting to find some war that wasn't based on a similar pile of lies, and I just couldn't. Um, when, I, when I looked into you know, the ways in which the United States actually compares to the rest of the world, I actually thought I might find more ways in which the United States was number one, you know? I mean, it's sort of famously number last in prisons and militarism and by many measures, environmentalism. And, and I knew that it was at the bottom of the wealthy 20 or 30 countries uh, in various uh, measures of health and well-being and education and civilization. But uh, I thought I would find some ways in which it really was number one. And the fact is that when you consider territory size, or population size, or economy size, which in many of these comparisons is, you know, absolutely necessary, or you're just not, you're just doing apples and oranges, uh, it's very, very hard uh, to find any way in which the United States is number one. I mean, there's sort of... No, wait, just to be clear, and you make this really clear in the beginning of the book, when you compare the U.S., which has 340 million people, to another country, the best way to do the comparison is based on per million or per thousand, right? Well, if you're talking about something that, that where per capita is really uh, part of the, of what you're dealing with, then you have to look at the, the numbers per capita. I mean, we can look at absolute numbers as well. And in some cases, those are interesting. Uh, But uh, in other cases, I think you really need to look at territory size. In other cases, I think you really need to look at, the size of the economy. And in some cases, you need to look at more than one of those. Uh, But it's very hard to find ways in which the United States is number one in something good and desirable, Uh, you know, especially when you factor in those relevant uh, considerations. Uh, We need to wrap up. We got one minute to go. Anything you want to say, final message? uh, You know, the, the... the thing we have to do is not despair, not think poorly of a country rather than well of a country, but stop identifying with countries and start taking pride in things we did as individuals or start enjoying the struggle we're engaged in as, as small groups or start appreciating the vast diversity and wonderful qualities of the entire species and many other species. Uh, there's, there's much to be gained and not much to lose in dropping national identity. Thanks so much. I've, you've been listening to the Rob Callbottom Up show. The guest for this show has been David Swanson. He's the director at World Beyond War, campaign coordinator of RootsAction.org, and the author of his new book, of a new book, Curing Exceptionalism, What's Wrong with How We Think About the United States and What We Can Do About It. Thanks, David. Thank you, Rob.